All right, you're back on board the sports train right here on News Radio 1580, WCCF, and online at WCCFAM.com. You can always listen to us. If you miss any part of the show, you can listen to us at thesportstrain.net. You can get there through WCCFAM.com. Just go to the sports tab and you can get a direct link right to our sports page. As always, we're brought to you by Beefo Brady's in Punta Gorda. You want to play some trivia? Get down there on Wednesdays. If you don't want to play trivia, trust me, they got plenty going on. And if you got a little nugget of gold that you need a little cash for, get the, go down and see Carl at Infinity Diamonds in Port Charlotte, just north of Sunoco, Sunuku, Sanaka. There you go. Whatever. Right on Midway. Right on yeah, Just north of Midway. <laughs> Much easier to put it that way. Southbound side of Port Charlotte. Go see Carl. Let him know the sports train sent you. Well, twice a year, something happens that we get into a little bit. We do. We do. Uh, a little fantasy, and we're talking baseball and yeah. football. It is our pleasure to welcome on board the sports train, Rick Morris, who has the website FantasyDraftHelp.com. Rick, how are you? Hi, thanks. Great to be with you guys today. Awesome, awesome. Well, we appreciate you jumping on board the sports train. We're going to dive right into this. Why don't you give us a little brief intro to your website and what you, what you got going on there? Okay, uh, we just posted a couple days ago our annual guide. Uh, this is Fantasy Baseball Draftology 2012. So you can find that on the main page of fantasydrafthelp.com, and it is free, which is a contrast to uh, some of our uh, peers in the industry. That's right. We and, like that, Rick. Good job. <laughs> thank <laughs> we, you. Thank we like you. that on the sports train. Price point everybody can afford. So uh, we, uh, we, we, we try to be good to the people. Uh, We've got in there our, our draft board. One of the foundational things about this, uh, since we're, we're talking about this and how we, we come about, you'll find on the draft board a category called UQB. That's the ultimate quantitative baseline. That's a proprietary statistic that we came up with. It is the ultimate measure of what a player did in the previous year expressed in a number, and it shows you the trade-offs in the different categories uh, because – in, in, the, in the major categories for hitting and, and for, for pitching, not to get too deep into it, but essentially we look at the standard deviation from the mean and if a player was better or worse than that in each of the categories. And then so you've got negative numbers in most cases and positive numbers being added together. In some cases it's all negative or in some cases it's all positive. But players who have the perfect score of 750 on the board, that's a pretty good indication that uh, they had about as good of a year as you could possibly have and that they were very, very positive in all categories. Definitely. And one guy who I think sits atop that chart probably did have as good of a year as you can expect, especially at this stage of his career where the future is very bright. He could get even better. You have rated number one on your board. The name kind of surprised me, but uh, I'm sure you could make a strong case to back it up, and that is Matt Kemp of the Los Angeles Dodgers. It's one of those things. I expected us to be kind of an outlier in that regard, uh, and, and we're prepared for that. Sometimes in football or in baseball we, we go a different way. Sometimes we end up agreeing. Uh, I had settled on him at number one before I started, uh, and, and, and uh, the ultimate decision with uh, the FDH stuff comes down to me. So uh, after talking to our people and, and looking at uh, the statistics, uh, I went with him. I was a little surprised to see it's kind of, I'm not going to say a consensus this year, but there are a number of places that happen to agree with us. I think they're looking at the same things that we are. Uh, his age, he, he's really on the ascendant curve of his career. Uh, of the last uh, three years, throw out 2010, that was kind of the donut hole, but he's on the way up. He figures to have better protection there. Now that Frank McCord is selling the team, and it's going to be more of a semblance of a real team there uh, around him. And that power-speed combo is just so rare. Uh, that, uh, you, you can count on one hand, basically, guys who can do it at that level, and that hand will include guys like Ryan Braun, who are uh, just a little bit too risky this year with the cloud hanging over him. Right, and that's certainly the thing you mentioned, risk with Kemp. It is sort of the off-the-field stuff with the Dodgers and to see what direction that's going to go. Over the offseason, we had a lot of off-the-field things that certainly influenced the draft and the drafts that are to come. And one thing, we're used to this guy being atop these lists, and uh, I'm seeing him a little further down, and that's, of course, Albert Pujols. Uh does going to a new team, switching leagues, did that influence the decision to move him down a little bit? Actually, no. Uh, and, and, and that's a thing where, ultimately, we've kind of disagreed the last couple of years uh, with, with the, the 
our uh, industry peers on pool holes. I can't think of a time, I might be wrong on this, but I can't think of a time when we had them number one. A lot of times we've had them number two, but again, our bias is towards that power speed combo. And uh, a couple of years ago, I think he stole 17 bases or right. so. He was pretty good for a first baseman, but that was kind of a blip. Yeah, only nine, le- only nine steals last year. And even like you said, he caps out at like 14 to 16 is sort of the high end of what you're going to get on the base pads out of Albert. Absolutely, and he hit two ninety nine. I'm not saying that he's starting to show signs already, but but basically he's starting to get to that point of his career where uh, he's maybe going to be ninety percent of what he was when he was the best player in, in baseball, and then kind of going from there. We'd rather be a little bit too early on calling it than a, than a little bit too late. We we certainly get less uh, static from people when we're too early on some guys than too late. Uh, the team that he's going to have around him in Anaheim, that outfield last year was a huge pile of disappointment. Uh, but uh, then again, the lineup in St. Louis outside of the middle core of it wasn't that great either. Uh, I, I don't I don't read too much into switching leagues with the pitchers. Look at what he did to Texas in the World Series. So there are not really any factors uh, that lead to him being number five uh, in, in that way, just other than we really like the four guys in front of him. Joining us, Rick Morris, FantasyDraftHelp.com. Here on the sports train. Now we talk about pool hole switching teams. Fielder switching, going from the National League to the American League and going to the Detroit Tigers. Does that have any value change for him? Not really. I mean, uh, we, we've got him number 12 overall uh, on, on our board, and we've got him number 5 among first basemen. Is it possible that we'd have him uh, a couple notches higher in the overall, and maybe one higher? if he was still in Milwaukee uh, rather than at Detroit? Yeah, possibly, because of the ballpark. It doesn't really uh, hurt as much. The biggest uh, commonality with both he and Pujols switching leagues here, for those who are in, and I realize that this isn't probably too many people, but anybody that's hardcore enough to be in AL or NL only leagues, right now in a National League only league, it's Joey Votto or Bust at first base. He's the only guy that's really worth uh, shelling out a huge jack for at this point uh, with the migration of the other superstar first baseman to the American League. That's true. You do have some, uh, like you said, hardcore players that might play within those formats, and the National League certainly lost two of its top guys. You know, we spent a lot of this uh, time on our show. My my partner Jake is a, a Brewers fan and certainly uh, sort of accepted that Prince was going to walk away. It surprised me, though. No one really saw the Tigers coming. And I think there is a risk that he's put himself in the type of ballpark that's going to really hurt his production. He's going to have to be more of a line drive, singles, doubles type type player. And frankly, when you look back at his career, this is a guy who hits in the 270s and 280s. We don't really see him as a, a 320 or 330 type hitter. That's true. And uh, there's going to be a little bit more warning track power for him in that park. Uh, just just because of the dimensions of it. He's going to have more doubles uh, along with less home runs, so that'll kind of somewhat offset it. But you're right, it's not a perfect fit, and it really is sort of born of the desperation. Uh, Mike Illich felt like he needed to do something. Victor Martinez went down. and This is a trend that we've seen in baseball the last couple of years of uh, teams coming out of nowhere. The Phillies did it with Cliff Lee. and uh, it, A lot of times previously, there, they, when you would hear about a mystery team in the mix, you couldn't take it too seriously. But these That's days, right. uh, teams have been known to manifest themselves at the very uh, latest point possible. Rick Morris, FantasyDraftHelp.com, on the phone with us. Now, we, we're, we're talking about Texas now, or Texas, t- the Tigers with Fielder. A guy, Verlander, is the name that comes up. I mean, obviously last year was you know, oh, outstanding. Historic, right, one of the best exactly. seasons of all time. Do you see him having that same type of performance this year? It's really interesting. I, certainly, I, I'm hoping for that. As somebody that's got him in a long-term keeper league, for a <laughs> there you go. I, would, I would hope so, fellas, but... Uh, the, the funny thing is is that you, you look at the top four pitchers on our board, and we've got them separated as a tier. Verlander, Kershaw, Halliday, we. I don't know that you could count on the same kind of years from any of those guys, but really even 95% of what they did uh, last year would, would be outstanding just because of uh, how great those years were. Verlander, I think, and that's why we have him number one, he might be the safest bet to come close to what he did last year because he was already starting to round the corner in 2010. This is a guy for a long time that people said, you know, he's a really excellent pitcher, well above average, but he's going to be dominant when he puts it all together. It was about 18 months or so, give or take, when I think he really started to turn the corner. So he's probably the best bet of any of the top guys. But to do exactly what he did last year, uh, that's that's just, it, it, that would be historic. 
Yeah, that would be tough to match. You you move over to the National League, and the guy, the reigning Cy Young Award winner there, a guy, again, on the Los Angeles Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw. I mean, he's even even younger than Verlander. Anybody who's in some kind of long-term keeper league, that would seem like a guy you want. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he He's a, a guy, I, I was racking my head to think, uh, I don't know that the Dodgers have produced uh, anybody through their system like him, any pitchers uh, since you had Hershiser, Hershiser and Valenzuela yeah. coming up in the 80s. Uh, it's, it's been such a long time. He was part of that great crop at Jacksonville uh, in the uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, uh, there, there may be folks uh, within range uh, of, of your signal who got a chance to uh, catch him there when he was going through, and, and he's, he's just been amazing. He's lived up to it. He was that bonus baby who came through the system. He was very good from the very beginning, with, with the, again, much like Verlander, with the upside that he finally reached last year. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if he stays healthy, uh, he's going to have a dominant first ballot Hall of Fame career. I think so, and, and maybe this is an indication. You know, L.A. is such a, a strange town when it comes to sports of an East Coast bias. Here's a guy who has now racked up some hardware he doesn't get a lot of press. You don't hear Clayton Kershaw when you think about the dominant players in baseball. You're absolutely right about that. And to a certain extent, if you heard about uh, Matt Kemp in, in the mainstream, it was probably because of the Rihanna connection. <laughs> right. so, I, I was checking I, I, out those pictures. I mean, I mean the, the yeah, story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, I don't know what it is right now. Baseball is not doing as good of a job of marketing guys to the mainstream you think back a couple of years uh greg maddox randy johnson ken griff jr when he was still around to whatever extent these are guys that the sort of acid test i use in my head is has my dad heard of these guys would he know he doesn't watch a ton of baseball but uh if you were to ask my dad who clayton kershaw or matt kemp <laughs> I, i'm not so sure he'd know ryan braun he probably wouldn't know until he f- failed the steroid uh, test and then you know beat the rap somehow so I don't know what it is, guys, but baseball's just not doing as good of a job. These guys are as good as the players I was mentioning from a couple of years ago, if not better in some instances, and the mainstream just doesn't have the awareness of them. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Rick Morris, FantasyDraftHealth.com. Now, you mentioned Ryan Braun, the steroid issue that he beat. Got a good lawyer for that one. Uh, <laughs> what does that do for his fantasy stock for this year? This was a really tough one uh, to do, and uh, I personally uh, I, I felt greatly inconvenienced by this because we were at the eleventh hour as far as laying out our draft guide, and we had to tear up and reformat a bunch of things in here. We had him at, uh, prior to uh, the reinstatement as about an end of the sixth round value to get him for about a third of the season. Uh, right now, we've got him number ten overall on the board, just because again, as, as I said about Matt Kemp previously, the power speed combo is so rare, and he gives that to you, but. The way that he beat this thing, uh, until proven otherwise, he did beat the rap on a technicality. We're talking about the chain of custody with this urine sample. Uh, merely by sticking it in the fridge a couple of days, that's not going to up your testosterone levels uh, to the extent to make you fail it here. So he, he's still under a cloud, and even if you think he, he was clean, and I'm not denying that somehow or another he may be, but... He's going to be playing with uh, tremendous media scrutiny. Look at a guy like Roger Maris who ended up losing his hair by the end of the season when he was chasing 61. I mean, Ryan Braun all of a sudden is not anonymous to the mainstream, and we'll have to see how he handles it. He seems happy in Milwaukee, but we're going to find out this year, guys. Yeah, and hiding in Milwaukee is not going to help this year. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Milwaukee's not typically a media market, but it will be, at least for the first. Ed Ed Werder, you know, they might be making that trip up there a little bit more. They used to go to Green Bay for (laughs) Brett Favre. Now they're going to head south to Milwaukee for Ryan Braun. Well, and with Braun, you also have the the idea they lost Prince Fielder, right? There's a protection issue there. You know, can he handle being the top guy that all eyes are on? That is an excellent point because uh, when you look at it right now, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to play out. I don't know that they've made the final determination. Is it going to be Corey Hart providing protection? Is it going to be Aramis Ramirez? These guys are fine, but... It's a different matter altogether when you have Prince Fielder uh, providing protection for you, which is something that Miguel Cabrera is going to find out in Detroit, and one of the reasons that, that we like him so very much. But that, that plus the additional third base eligibility. Joining us on the phone, Rick Morris, FantasyDraftHelp.com. Hey, Rick, we got to take a break, but can you hang on? Because we want to talk about your main city there uh, when we come back from the break. Can you hang on? Certainly. Absolutely. All right, you're listening to Sports Train on WCCF 1580 and WCCFAM.com. I know a place where the grass 
All aboard. You are riding the sports train through the world of sports. Covering a lot of ground here in Southwest Florida on a Sunday morning. One thing we've been looking at with our guest Rick Morris, we're taking a look at uh, fantasy baseball. And uh, we're going to keep doing that, taking it in a few different directions. Uh, I want to give Rick a, a quick plug, uh, certainly an influence on, on this show. Uh, Rick's got a great draft site. We invite you to check that out at fantasydrafthelp.com. He's also a podcast kind of guy, something that uh, yeah, our roots like traits. Yeah. We like that. You know, the second browser we always talk about while you're doing whatever you're doing. I invite you to check out uh, the FDH Lounge. Uh, you can search for that on Google. We'll put our uh, we'll put a plug to that up on our Facebook page today. And uh, he's got some great guests. You never know. You tune into the show. I mean, he he could have anyone. Bob Barker. I have all kinds of uh, pop culture type guys that uh, he's interviewed. So definitely check that out. One thing that we want to check out here in Charlotte County, we've got some great sponsors. We talk about Beefo Brady's. We talk about Infinity Diamonds. This is a natural, and Larry's ready to do this. Uh, what can we do with Infinity Diamonds? Oh, I was talking about our Infinity Diamonds in the rough. Do you see any players out there in baseball that might turn the corner and become a future superstar? I think there are a few, uh, certainly. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some, some folks in your, in your listening base uh, might be uh, very, very happy to hear about one. I, I have uh, Matt Moore uh, rated more highly than uh, do a lot of folks uh, in, in the industry. We've got a number 30. We're applauding you, Rick. We, we it, love hearing that. It, Keep even going, over buddy. Strasburg? <laughs> <laughs> even over Steven Strasburg? Uh, well, not over Strasburg, no. Although, again, that's another guy that we have higher uh, than a lot of folks in the industry. We've got more at 31 among pitchers. Uh, Strasburg at uh, 12, which which is certainly a higher. Really? And, that- and just Aren't Just you worried about uh, innings there? I mean, do you, do you think they really throw him into the fire and let him get, you know, 30-plus starts with six, seven, eight innings a start? No way. I'm not really sure that that's going to be the case. Uh, and, and certainly they have enough bodies to go with a six-man rotation for a period of time, and, and you are hearing about that. But I think, quite frankly, if you're a Strasburg uh, owner, you're going to sacrifice gladly, I would say, quantity of innings for quality of them uh we we really differ a lot one of the things we have on our draft board that you'll find in our guide is our our so-called experts draft board we we take a composite of some of our leading peers out there in some of the magazines and the big websites and and everything they've got them 25th collectively we've got them 12th so uh we're we're inclined to go with the upside of of a steven strasberg there are there's nothing to indicate that he's not going to be ready to go i think they're going to treat him with uh, as as much in a way akin gloves as is necessary and uh, to a certain extent also the guy right below him on our board uh, tommy hansen uh that's another guy where we say go for it 22nd on the experts draft board we've got him 13th uh, he's got as much upside as just about any in uh, fantasy baseball. And yeah, there are some lingering questions from last year. But if you're sitting there in the sixth or seventh round or eighth round, which is about where we'd have him slotted, you got to go for him at that point. Nice. I, I, I certainly like Hanson as one of those uh, infinity diamonds in the rough. We'll keep an eye on him. Let's stick with the Rays for another minute. Uh, one thing I looked at your board. I think you got Longoria seventeenth, and uh, I can't say I blame you for that ranking. But as a Rays fan, it is somewhat disappointing because two or three years ago, I know I did my draft, I I pulled the trigger on him in the first round. I mean, this was a a top five, maybe top ten type guy. It does seem after the past couple of years, he slipped back a little bit. Well, part of the value is what everybody else in your your draft is going to do. And he's going to slide because a lot of people, quite frankly, just look at what happened last year. And last year was was not a good one for him. Uh, 244 batting average, some of the other uh, peripherals. Uh, were decent enough, but here's the funny thing about that. He is where he is, uh, mostly because of things that have happened around him at that position. I, when I first looked at this at the end of last season, I anticipated slotting him late uh, to uh, late first round somewhere in that ballpark. Then you've got Miguel Cabrera picking up third base eligibility. Then you've got Hamley Ramirez picking up third base eligibility. And although I have him behind all of these guys, Mark Trumbo also now with third base eligibility. So, uh, 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 good point. Uh, External very, factors. Very yeah. Yes, it was a very weak position heading into that, but it got a little bit stronger. That's why we've got uh, Longoria fourth at the position, and that's why we think you can get him in, in the mid second round. And I think he'll be a tremendous, tremendous value at that point. FantasyDraftHelp.com. We got Rick Morris on the phone. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do a little shifting here because. Uh, Doing some research on you and the site, we see that you are a long-suffering Cleveland sports fan. And one of the things the sports train likes to do is go to a city. Oh, yeah, we move this and train. And overanalyze the city <laughs> up there. So tell us just, what is it like to be a long-suffering Cleveland fan? 
Well, you know, we uh, we, we do cover this a uh, decent amount, uh, the FDHLounge.com, uh, you know, our, our, our all-topics companion to FantasyDraftHelp.com, and it's one of those things where I do feel as though, it, it, a lot of times it's just a parochial matter where people aren't going to care about your local area, but I know that there's a national fascination with Cleveland, and that's why I write and sometimes broadcast about it from time to time, because as bad as you think it is, it's actually far worse than that. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we had Jason Stark on the show after the Phillies won the World Series, and he was talking about uh, 25 years since the 76ers won the, uh, the championship in, in Philadelphia in 83, and I said, I, I feel like a convict in, in a bad movie. 25 years, I could do that standing on my head. <laughs> nice. because, you know, nobody's won anything in a major championship, uh, even remotely uh, in, in my lifetime. It was well before I was born, and I, I got to tell you too, and it's not going to be—I'm not going to make myself a popular man around these parts for saying this—but the fans are part of the problem, and I find myself railing at the fans a lot because everybody just gets so overwrought and PO'd. We run guys out of town, uh, you know, at, at the drop of a hat, and, and sometimes people uh, and institutions need to be run out of town. Sometimes coaches need to be fired, co- coach uh, quarterbacks need to be run out of town, etc. But not always. And everybody here is knee-jerk. Everybody just kind of emotes. Everybody feels entitled to uh, put whatever kind of bad takes out there. So it just makes it that much worse because the fans, quite frankly, are part of the problem. So uh, you do like Ernest Biner. <laughs> that was... I'm not going to lie, when, when we got uh, Mike Oliphant for him the next year, I thought, I mean, in all seriousness, that fumble ruined Biner. Uh, and I think that's ultimately why he got traded, because the next year he couldn't stop fumbling the ball. And so, I want to put this out here, Ernest Biner, the running backs coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, <laughs> oh thank you very much. <laughs> but let's well, stick with football. You mentioned Cleveland Browns, and let, let's see, they've, they've had some hard times in the past, and frankly, they had some hard times last year. You got to yeah. start with quarterback when you when you approach this off season. As someone there on the scene, have you seen any indications? Number one, that Colt McCoy can be the man, or number two, that someone like a Mike Holmgren, who's so known for uh, latching onto these star quarterbacks, would have the faith to give him the reins for yet another season at quarterback? Starting with McCoy, this is this is very much a minority opinion. I, I still believe that. I, I, w- I was screaming at the top of my lungs going into last year when they did nothing to upgrade what turned out to be what the worst wide receiving core in the league, an offensive line that uh, without uh, Eric Steinbach, who went down with back surgery, uh, was very poor. It's not like Joe Thomas can man more than one position on that line. <laughs> Alex Mack is <laughs> fine center, but that's two spots out of five on a pretty putrid line without Eric Steinbach. They did nothing to help McCoy. He was learning a brand new system, a coach who wasn't doing a very good job of calling the offense. I, I'm very agnostic on the subject of Colt McCoy. I don't think we've seen enough, and I don't think it's worth the haul to go get Robert uh, Griffin the third because it's going to cost an arm and a leg. And, it will. Uh, that'll, that'll mean that you can't use those picks on a guy like Justin Blackman to improve things. Uh, as far as Holmgren goes, you know, I was very much, I, I was on board. Uh, some of my friends were laughing that I was on board with uh, Pat Shermer when he got hired. Uh, I liked the bloodlines. Uh, his Uncle Fritz was, was a Hall of Famer. I believe in bloodlines and all manners of sport here. But a very disappointing first year of the unified regime. I was not a Mangini guy at all, but I certainly expected a lot better. And everybody is going to be on the hook for results in 2012, and deservedly so. Well, I was sitting here last night uh, watching TNT, watching the Miami Heat play, and well, there's a guy named LeBron James that plays for the Heat now. <laughs> and, and, and I was doing some research looking over your site, and I got to thinking, as a guy who's from Cleveland, is the LeBron fallout finally over, or is that still hanging over the city's head? Oh, I think so. Uh, and and I, I think there's nothing like getting a guy like Kyrie Irving and, uh, God willing, another foundation piece in a very deep draft this year. Uh, there's nothing like being able to look forward to a great future to be able to do that. But I, I, I have to say... The national media and everybody really missed why the most people or the people entitled to be angry were angry in Cleveland when LeBron left. The untold story, and you'll, you'll find it on our blog at the fdhlounge.blogspot.com. We chronicled it over time. LeBron held a gun to their head for seven years. He forced them to make all the short-term moves that they did. Everything that he did, in bringing his posse around, putting them on the payroll, and it was always the whole, hey, you don't want me to leave in 2010, do you? 
they did everything he wanted, and he still left. He still left. I, I wouldn't have as big of a problem with him leaving if he hadn't done that. If he hadn't extorted them. If he hadn't treated the organization like Tony Soprano treated, uh, you know, the organizations that he was uh, warding over at that point. You know, a bar that he was going to suck everything out of, for example. That's how LeBron treated the Cavs. And you, you can tell from um, the timber of my voice that I still remember it clearly. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing like having great things to look forward to, a wonderful young man who can really play the game in Kyrie Irving. There's nothing like that uh, to help you turn the page a little bit. Rick Morris, FantasyDraftHelp.com, is not buying a LeBron Heat jersey anytime soon. We can tell that by his voice. He's not, but, but he is uh, bullish on the future of the Cavs, so I like to hear that. Let, let's move it back to the baseball diamond, because here's another team that you look at, uh, they were close a few years ago, and they've certainly stepped back. But before we get into the Indians on the field, what is up with Albert Bell? Please tell me. <laughs> did you see the picture? I mean, did the guy age 30 years in the past couple of days? What's going on? Yeah. yeah that, that's Kids, amazing. don't use steroids, right? <laughs> <laughs> he looks as old exactly. as Bob Feller. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, I mean, he, he was, he, you know, if, if Bob Feller was still around, I think he'd, he'd look at Albert Bell and maybe see him as a contemporary. Hey, aren't you cool, Papa Bell? Didn't I play against you uh, in some of the uh, barnstorming games? I mean, yeah, Albert uh, not looking so great there in those uh, pictures. I mean, looking old, uh, he doesn't necessarily look unhealthy, but uh, my, yeah, he, right. he does look like he's aged. He, he certainly has. And the other thing in the off season, and again, we're sorry to laugh, but hey, a good laugh is worth anything. What up, what's up with Fausto Carmona? I mean, or excuse me, Roberto Hernandez. Is he going to be an Indian uh, this year? <laughs> par for the course with, with this putrid organization. I, I just, as, as a Tribe fan and somebody who, who grew up on it and went to so many games with, with my mom and really cherished those memories, uh, I, I'm just, uh, just absolutely disgusted uh, with this organization. And they had a chance to cut themselves loose uh, from Fausto or Roberto or whatever the hell his name is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they didn't do it. Uh, that, that was $7 million. They could have applied in other ways. The problem is not merely that they're cheap. The problem is what they do with their money. $7 million to him. Uh, we're supposed to be doing jumping jacks because uh, Derek Lowe's only getting $5 million out of his bloated contract. Right. Well, and five, and five the key offseason, they re-signed Grady Sizemore, right? And uh, yeah, another, Grady, another year paying him to sit on the bench. Yeah, Grady Sizemore. It, the money that they paid all these chodes collectively, they could have given to Prince Fielder. And, and that's the whole thing here. It's, you wouldn't have to bump the payroll that much in order to get some real bang for your buck here. But instead, uh, again, they're, they're just plodding along. The contracts are all expiring after this year. I mean, there's, there's options, but uh, the entire roster could be bare if they wanted it to be. So there's a lot of... Uh, right. right. One way they could certainly selling. save money, a guy we're interested here in the local area, a kid from Charlotte County where we're broadcasting today, is Matt Laporta, a guy who uh, I think he started with Milwaukee and ended up on yeah. Cleveland in the uh, Sabathia deal a few years ago. And he, a Florida Gator, I like that. Uh, do you see this guy? I guess he's gotten off to a slower start of his career than we would have liked. Do you think he could turn it around and become a uh, a premier player for the club? I'm very dubious. I mean, thus far, this guy's got uh, quadruple A stamp, uh, Sam Horn stamped all mm -hmm. over him. I mean, he, he could still turn it around at some point, but uh, when, when you're looking up at, uh, and, and no offense to a guy who had a good year for your team, but when you're looking up at Casey Kochman on the depth chart. <laughs> right. uh, Fair with, enough, with, yeah. With, with, with his slaptastic uh, first base quote-unquote power, uh, Matt Laporta, yeah, this is a guy that was given every opportunity. He was the foundation of that very ill-fated C.C. Sabathia trade, and that was the one thing that this regime could at least point to prior to uh, the Sabathia trade. Well, uh, sure, our drafting sucks, or at least it did prior to 2008, but we make these great trades. When we're trading away all of our assets, we get guys back in return. Well, Matt Laporta ended that undefeated streak with a thud, and, uh, yeah, he could still amount to something, but he is going to be starting the year at uh, Columbus and uh, possibly awaiting a May or June uh, call-up uh, once everybody else on the roster gets off to a slow start. Well, we'll certainly look for that, Rick. You painted a great picture of, of Cleveland sports, and I think upon listening to that, Florida fans here, stop complaining. We don't have it that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You, you really don't. You really don't. Plus, me, the weather's good. Little, you know? Let me send a little love to him. A huge Detroit Red Wings guy. A little bit of love for, I know it's been a tough year, but uh, Steve Eiserman doing a great job with uh, the Lightning there. Definitely. That guy is probably my ultimate sports hero. 
and I'm rooting for the Lightning. It's great to see him make that transition, a star on the ice and now a star in the uh, in the box suite overlooking the club. So we like Last to see act. that, definitely. Yep. Rick, thank you so much for being here. A couple of great segments. We appreciate that. We invite our listeners to check out your site at fantasydrafthelp.com and, of course, the FDH Lounge. We'll have that up on our own Facebook page promoting that later today. So check that out. Thanks, Thanks Rick. so much, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rick.